Good morning. I'm back reading Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. I have my same setup as last time, a little different back of the camera and my ear pod thing. <clears throat> I'm hoping you can hear me okay because the AC's on. It's going to be a toasty day here in Portland. Not too hot though. I think we're just in the mid 80s. Okay. Let's dive back in and see what we learned today. Nonlinear and iterative. The pace and pathways of change. Nonlinear, not denoting, involving, or arranged in a straight line. Footnote one, Oxford Dictionary. I think I'm not going to read the websites. Yeah, I'm not going to read the websites. You can buy the book if you want all the details. Um, iterative. Involving repetition as A, expressing repetition of a verbal action, or B, relating to or being, or being iteration of an operation or procedure. Footnote to Merriam-Webster. Grounding in nature. Many of us have heard some version of the butterfly effect, that a butterfly flaps its wings and sets in motion a series of escalating changes and reactions that lead to a hurricane. This is also called chaos theory, a study of behavior and conditions of dynamic changing systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions. There's chaos, there are cycles, there are winding paths. Each change process is unique. Nature has taught me so much about moving with the seasons. This is a quote. That we need to honor times of harvest and times of rest. That the frenetic pace of doing, doing, doing without being present with each other and the season we're in, what is happening around us, is unnatural and counter to life. So it has made me realize how important community ceremony and celebration is to our efforts to transform the world. Brenda Salgado. From its own fetal curves, green fiddleheads produce ancient spiral formations. The fiddleheads teach me to unfurl my own lineage and experience patterns, examine them, be with them, and listen to their messages. The fiddleheads are gifted time travelers. If I don't learn the lesson now, the pattern will show up in my life like an unwelcome visitor. By meditating with the spiral in mind, I can focus my attention on re-encountering the old wounds differently and imagine a new possibility. The fiddleheads teach me the vitality of a perspective shift. The fiddleheads teach me to respect the slowest micro-movements and own my way forward. Marie Vargis. Quote, climbing poetry's Nama Peniman asked, I wonder if compost believes in life after death. Like compost, our work is nonlinear in a static time frame. Not discounting set goals and objectives, compost has taught me how to reflect and grow from an action or effort in organizing beyond the breadth of con conventional expectation. Our successes can be measured more than one way. How did we learn from our hiccups, errors, mistakes, fuck ups, drama, and difficulty that goes into an action that goes into an action? Our shit. How can future generations learn from and build on what we do, our work and intentions now? See our picket. Quote The universe is both orderly and chaotic. We understand it to a point and then there is mystery. And that is not linear or cumulative. There is no eventual elimination of mystery. There will always be mystery and knowledge. Humans are both understandable and mysterious. Communion is all about acceptance and organizing is about both. Peter Hardy. Transformation doesn't happen in a linear way, at least not one we can always track. It happens in cycles, convergences, explosions. If we release the framework of failure, we can realize that we are in iterative cycles and we can keep asking ourselves, how do I learn from this? Emotional growth is nonlinear. It really 
It feels really important to me to include pieces on grief and emotions in this book because as people participating in movements, we are faced with so much loss. And because we have to learn to give each other more time to feel, to be in our community. Not to come to a standstill as a movement, but to take turns actually feeling what is happening to and around us. And letting our feeling help us understand what we must do. Because that is what we are creating. A world where we can feel ourselves and each other and do less harm and generate more freedom. As movements are made up of humans, movement growth is also nonlinear. There are two major movement cycles that I want to uplift here, Occupy and Black Lives Matter slash Movement for Black Lives. As recent nonlinear organizing processes that started off to speak to class and race intersections in the U.S. respectively. Both grew from common longing, from a relinquishing of control, and from a celebration of readerful transformation. Both have been challenged by the limits of our human capacity to cooperate, sustain, and grow in conflict. By the weight of large-scale expectations on something long-awaited but new. By the learning pains of organizing for depth in the age of social media. However, these are the most exciting mass movements I have lived through and both and are both part of my justice, of any justice we are creating. In a nonlinear, in a nonlinear process, everything is part of the learning, every step. That includes constructive criticism. It is part of the feedback loop. Experiment, gather feedback, experiment again. This is how we learn. That said, the line between constructive critique and hater is a hard one to navigate. In this section, I will also offer a protocol for haters who are the least useful parts for movement building and social transformation. A time traveling emotion. In the moment, I am not ready to feel the feeling. My skin too firm, my faith too solid. When the future all seemed ahead of me, it was easier to hold an emotion into me and believe it was gone. It was easier to fold an emotion into me and believe it was gone, or at least silent. When my feelings started to work their way back out of me to resurface, I was overwhelmed. I put my hands over my mouth to hold it in, but it didn't matter. I was brimming, screaming. I am not the only one like this. It may be a human condition or an empath condition or a black or a black girl magic. It may even be an epidemic of consciousness. I am not convinced we get to know that. But in my 20s, when I was get thinking about things that were leaping out of me like emo tweens, that's when I learned about the time traveling emotion. It is like anything else that traverses time, both fully of another time and fully present in the pace, place when it appears. In the case of grief, the time traveling emotion touches into your sadness over a present day experience of absence and then drags forward a living satchel of the most tender, innocent moments, the smallest memory, or perhaps sucks your heart back in time. My grandfather, impossibly big and godly, hugging me in his own garage just out of the near Georgia sun and the smell of hay and horses around us. It isn't just the senses, but the complex spectrum of a moment completely felt. And the more I learn to feel, the less time it takes a time-traveling emotion to catch me. Years instead of decades, hours instead of months, seconds instead of weeks. I am even learning, sometimes more often, to feel in real time and to survive feeling a whole emotion in real time. With less shame, I say no to anything that wastes my time. I gather and give myself hours that belong to no one else, alone or with healer types. I claim time when I can be in my body and self. And in that solitude or healing company, I become a defined place for a time-traveling emotion to locate an X on the nonlinear map of my emotional life. The emotion is a living thing showing one face when it arrives and as it leaves, I see it's really a pattern, delta if blood and veins connecting aspects of myself as disparate as lung and toe. Music is one of the systems by which emotions traverse time, both in tone, content, and something as simple as age. Some emotions stay in the soundtrack of their root memory. There is a Janet Jackson song that opens the way to an emotion of innocence. 
A new song can surprise me when it opens the way to something dusty and eager to be felt. Each time traveling emotion softens me, especially those that return often. It's so humbling to feel something in spite of logic, time, circumstance, and thinking the feeling is finished. Grief is a sharp visitor, her long nails a surprise in my chest. Heartbreak is heavy and fireworky, like full body tears, swollen eyes, joy melts my jaw. It's all waves, though, moving toward and up, through and beyond. And once I've survived an emotion that has reached across time to demand my attention, I feel so resilient. That resilience makes me soft and wide enough to handle the complex mercurial existence of the present moment. I trust myself to feel, to grow from what I feel, not to run when I sense a feeling coming. I am a student of this phenomenon that makes time a shapeshifter. I still fold moments of particular intensity into me, but now I do so with a bit of a spell attached. I promise I will be ready for you when you find me. Quote, life is a matter of a miracle that is collected over time by moments, flabbergasted to be in each other's presence. Timothy Speed, Levitch, Waking Life. Spell for grief or letting go. Adequate tear twisting up directly from my heart and wrung out across the vocal cords until only a gasp remains. At least an hour a day spent staring at the truth in numb silence. A teacup of whiskey held with both hands, held still under the whispers of permission from friends who can see right through okay and fine, in absence of theory, quite as necessary. Poetry, your own and others, on precipice, abandonment, nature, and death. Courage to say what has happened, however strangling the words are, and space to not say a word. A brief dance with sugar to honor the legacies of coping that got you this far. Sentences spoken with total pragmatism that provide clear guidance of some direction to move in, full of the tender care and balance of choice and not having to choose. Screaming why and or expressing fury at the stupid, unfair fucking game of it all. This may include hours and hours, even lifetimes of lost faith. Laughter undeniable, unpretended. A walk in the world, all that gravity, with breath and heartbeat in your ears. Fire for all that can be written. Moonlight, the more full, the more nourishing. Stories ideally of coincidence and heartache in the sweetest tiny moments. Time, more time, and then more time. Enough time to remember every moment you had with that one now taken from you and to forget to think of it every moment. And just a glimpse of tomorrow, either in the face of an innocent or the realization of a dream. This is a non-linear spell. Cast it inside your heart. Cast it between yourself and any devil. Cast it into the parts of you still living. Remember you are water. Of course you leave salt trails. Of course you're crying. Flow. P.S. If there happens to be a multitude of griefs upon you, individual and collective, or fast and slow, or small and large, add equal parts of these considerations. That the broken heart can cover more territory, that perhaps love can only be as large as grief demands, that grief is the growing up of the heart that bursts boundaries like an old skin or a finished life, that grief is gratitude, that water seeks scale, that even your tears seek the recognition of community, that the heart is a front line and the fight is to feel in a world of distraction, that death might be the only freedom that your grief is a worthwhile use of your time, that your body will feel only as much as it is able to, that the ones you grieve may be grieving you, that the sacred comes from the limitations, that you are excellent at loving. From Liberty Plaza, footnote three. I originally published this on my website on October 9th, 2011, after visiting the Occupy Wall Street encampment at Liberty Plaza, Ducati Park. Yesterday, I got to Liberty Plaza, finally. Since it came to my attention, I have been making my way toward it, wanting to see it and feel it myself, though with some trepidation. I tend to roll with a critical crowd, and I have to work hard sometimes to keep my heart open when there are lots of critical questions sitting there for me to ask. Is it a bunch of privileged white kids? Is it stinky dropouts? Is it a mashup of wing that messaging? Is it our... Tame career square? 
Or is it the decentralized movement we have been awaiting? Is it safe for queer people, people of color, for me? Is it rooted with existing movements for economic justice? I had to know. So I went. Getting off the train at Wall Street, there is immediately a little handwritten, taped up piece of paper pointing towards Zuccotti Park. First, I walked around the perimeter lined with people facing outward with signs taking in the love, admiration, disrespect, insults, and ignorance of the passerby with a generally curious and calm presence. I wound my way through the inner park, taking in all the systems and offerings and community there, as well as hundreds of others like myself come to see and feel this massive cultural happening. I saw a few folks I know, but they were also there seeing how to plug in. That excited me. What I felt there was a resounding yes, yes to all my questions and many more. More precisely, what I felt was the surge of energy I used to get at a march, realizing that there were so many people waiting, wanting change, people who had walked completely different pathways to reach the same conclusion that they were still, that they were willing to give their precious life force to changing the systems of our time. This has the potential to be deeper because it feels less fleeting, less temporary, less spectacle. Marches have left me feeling so unheard for so long. Here I noticed the wingnut messaging in the whiteness, and yet I felt close to tears a few times, seeing unexpected diversity in the crowd, seeing the self-organized systems emerging for creation of art, sharing of information, health and wellness. There was even a table of coaches to help people figure out what their role in the movement could be. No one is special and everyone is needed. To speak to the whiteness of the crowd, I actually felt moved to see how many white people, very normal looking white people, standing around the edge of the park looking liberated themselves, holding up signs that criticize capitalism. Some were speaking from their privilege and others from their own economic struggles, but to have masses of white people in the streets talking about the economy with a progressive decentralized grassroots perspective and have it not be the Tea Party is a tipping point signal. The crises are becoming clear even to those not being directly oppressed or those, being, or those directly organizing. And people are ready to stand up and dream of something different. And yes, of course, it would be amazing to see even more people of color there. My sense was that we need only show up in whatever capacity we can and there we will be. There is also a case to be made for white privileged folks sleeping in the park to hold space for people of color and poor folks who may not have the luxury to drop work and do so, but are in alignment. Solidarity, solidarity can look so many different ways. It's movement. I've been in movement spaces for a long time, and we have a way of doing things that is so steeped in critique that I have often wondered if we would strangle movements before it could blossom. Sometimes I think we put up the critiques to excuse ourselves from getting involved. And sometimes I think we do it to protect our hearts from getting broken if it doesn't work out. Critique alone can keep us from having to pick up the responsibility of figuring out solutions. Sometimes I think we need to liberate ourselves from critique, both internal and external, to truly give change a chance. The major critique I have heard of this effort is the lack of demands and multitude of messages. My thoughts so far, humans have a multitude of cares of passions trying to lockstep us into one predictable way of being is the essential desire of corporations. Because if you can predict what people will want to do, then you can profit by, by coming up with appropriate products and activities for them. This movement is instead making it as easy as possible to enter, no matter what passion brought you to the square. And in terms of the demands, it seems the central demand is to build and expand a conversation that is long overdue in this country, a conversation that doesn't have simple cut and dry demands. We are realizing that we must become the system we need. No government, political party, or corporation is going to care for us, so we have to remember how to care for each other. And that will take time and commitment, a willingness to step outside of the comfort of the current and lean into the unknown together. And that will take, okay. Um, 
to listen to each other across all real and perceived divides. I have heard stories of folks having issues, bringing them to General Assembly and being able to shift the process even as newcomers. I have seen random people called for the people's microphone and others, including myself, jump in and to spread the message, regardless of the message. The whole thing seems so utterly not produced, not micromanaged, and not acting from a place of crisis, which excuses top-down elitist decision-making processes, not rushing itself. I see this as a natural evolution from conversations and gatherings and organizing that has been building for years. Call and response across time from the battle in Seattle, the street forums that take analysis beyond the choir. It's taken a long time to get to this place. Now it's time to let the fruit burst on our tongues and savor the flavor of something tangible that we grew with our courage to hold the line against the inhumanity of corporate greed. Let's spend less time on the imperfection of the process and more time articulating and crystallizing our lessons. Liberty Plaza is important. The call to Occupy Wall Street is important. And like any anti-Zionist American with an analysis of imperialism here at home and abroad, I don't love that this proliferation of events is naming themselves Occupy Insert City. I get it. We are going to occupy America with justice and take up the space of being in this country, in these cities and in these banks, be vocal occupants of this place reshaping it to something that yields solidarity in place of shame. I love the other options I'm hearing. Decolonize, insert city, occupy within, and foreclose, insert institution. It feels spacious. It feels like something you can do no matter where you are by authenticity applying yourself, by authentically applying yourself to the changes you wish to see. At Liberty Plaza is a physical o- occupation. In Detroit, it may be a massive redistribution distribution of food and shelter resources heading into the winter. Tomorrow, I will get to see what that what it looks like in Oakland. Don't sit this out. It has room for you. Find out, start, or help shape what is happening in your town. Let it breathe. Footnote four. This piece was originally published at adrianmariebrown.net. Move to write more. Just home from Occupy Oakland and hearing reports <coughs> from the first General Assembly meeting in Detroit. Last night, I heard from folks who had gone to check out Occupy SF, and I am following the budding of several cities and their parallel efforts. In each instance, there are various levels of excitement and disappointment. There is such urgency in the multitude of crises we face, it can make it hard to remember that, in fact, it is urgency thinking and urgent constant, unsustainable growth that has got us to this point and that our potential success lies in doing deep, slow, intentional work. We need to go beyond having a critique, counter analysis, alternative systemic plan for society. We have to actually do everything differently, aligned with a different set of core principles for existence especially our movement building. How do we live compassion, justice, love, accessibility in alignment with this planet and with the people on it? How do we live our values? As we are, so it, our work, our movement will be. For the majority of us, myself included, this means vast ongoing transformation from how we are currently living and being. And as we transform, transform, we see more things that need transformation within ourselves and the world. It is so important to cultivate our patience, our thoughtfulness, our willingness to slow down and seek the wisdom of those not already part of our movement. Not to get them in step with our point of view, but because we need their lived experiential wisdom to shape solutions that will work for the majority of living beings. It is imperative to regenerate our curiosity, our genuine interest in different opinions and in people we don't know yet. Can we see them as part of ourselves and maintain curiosity, especially when we want to constrict or critique? Can we take our little spark from the fire that has started and truly let it breathe enough to grow? Occupy Wall Street didn't start off as big as it is now. It started small and built community, cultural norms and communication, and it's still building. The challenge in other cities is that we are all starting off with a lot more people at the table with ideas and directions and agendas to push. 
That means time spent on getting a clear decision-making process in place will be worth every second in the long run. That means facilitators skilled in consensus and synthesis have an important role to play. That means that individuals and organized bodies with all variety of experiences are showing up and we have to humble ourselves to value all contributions from the newest people to the most organized, professionalized folks. That means our socialized ex practices to control each other and compete are going to emerge and we have to be attentive and accountable as we try to open ourselves to something larger than our particular formation or analysis. That means we can do, be, and create whatever we want to see, knowing ours is one effort in the midst of many, and the multitude is where our power lies. Before joining Occupy Oakland folks today, I got to witness two incredible presentations on movement and network building at the Engage Community of Practice gathering I am facilitating. One of them from Jenny Lee offered a key metaphor that is used at allied media projects, the role of organizers in an ecosystem to be earthworms, processing and aerating soil, making fertile ground out of the nutrients of sunlight, water, and everything that dies to nurture the next cycle of life. And that has come before is, all that has come before is in the soil and now yields the movement to counter Wall Street and the systems of capitalism and create a new economy of relationships, a new society of care and respect. In that paradigm, there is no failure. Everything we attempt, everything we do is either growing up as its, grass, as its roots grow deeper or it's decomposing, leaving its lessons in the soil for the next attempt. Another lesson I observed from the people's mic experience at Occupy Wall Street if someone called for the mic, they were granted it, but if people weren't feeling the statement, eventually they stopped repeating it. I shared this observation with Jenny, and she observed that in a way, Twitter has prepped us for the succinct and self-selected rebroadcasting of each other. And just like with the people's mic and our social media efforts, what we pay attention to grows. Let's cultivate the movement we want and leave space for others to do the same. There's room. Let it breathe. Quote, we're basically this very young species, only 200,000 years old. We're one of the newcomers, and we're going through the same process that other species go through, which is how do I keep myself alive while taking care of the place that's going to keep my offspring alive? There's this part here. The protocol for haters. As much as we do, as much as we who do and or fund social and environmental justice speak of movements, when they actually spark, many of us cannot tolerate all the newness and unknown that comes along with scaling up our efforts to create change. We, are, we want instant order, more familiarity, a perfect plan for all of eternity, a set of lockstep agreements to either adopt or reject. We can also be quite vicious when movements appear from places we weren't looking. Ducati Park in Ferguson, Missouri, were not hotbeds of movement, investment, and organizing at the moment when they became the locations for historical change. And with both Occupy and Black Lives Matter, a lot of people who didn't create the movement moments had a lot to say, a lot of critiques on what the movements were not doing and or needed to do. Sometimes it's hard to see what that ongoing movement work is always in the soil of new and rapid growth. And sometimes it's hard to admit that for all our strategizing, we weren't the ones to articulate the moment. Sometimes it can make us into haters. Footnote five, hater, a person that simply cannot be happy for another person's success. So rather than be happy, they make a point of exposing a flaw in that person. Um, okay. There's a poem that just kind of is inserted here, so I think I'll read that before moving on because I don't want to skip it entirely. When are we? When are we? I feel I, we, all mine, are lost in time. They raised the battle flag in Avon, Minnesota today to show the borderlessness, but we already knew everywhere is war. But when and why do we hear bugles? Do we smell smoke? when we hug black bodies. 
Oh, the church is on fire. No, another one. 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 It's those ghosts again. Their children's children are nonlinear haunt. But isn't this the future? How are a million eyes open, but no one will look? When can we run, go hide? When are we, these days of ashes? We wake up weary. Which illusion is killing us? Which construct? Is it our flesh haunted or our time? Each moment fills up with smoke. We are catching fire again. We feel the rocking of ships, the grief of the sea. We stumble. We moonwalk in chains. We dance free. And when could we just be? I've been disappointed by how many movement haters there are, how many people have attacked these movements on site, or more precisely, these movement cycles, because this is all part of a larger, ongoing, intersectional, many-headed movement toward justice and liberation. There are way too many people in critique mode who belong to no formation, who spend their lives writing volunteer think pieces and 140-character bursts on the internet. It makes me feel defensive of the messy, chaotic beauty of transformation. Uprisings and resistance and mass movement require a tolerance of messiness, the tolerance of many, many paths being walked on at once. I feel in me a movement doula energy. The baby knows exactly what it needs to know. It is doing what it is meant to do. Babies don't learn to eat or poop in a toilet or walk instantly. It is slow, iterative, repeating attempts fueled by curiosity and longing. The parents know what they need to know and are learning what they need to learn. Parents don't know how to raise a child because they read all the books they went to the classes. They figure it out in the dead of night, covered in shit and tears, and finally holding a sleeping child, stunned by love. I have an inner protocol in my doula work with parents and babies. Ask myself if I am needed. Support only is needed. Do absolutely everything that is needed. Change the diapers, sweep the floor, rub mama's feet, take out the trash. No task is menial and make space for the natural order to emerge. I offer from this defensive and sacred space a protocol for those who are most comfortable approaching movements from a place of critique, aka haters. One, ask if this movement formation message is meant for you, if this serves you. Two, if yes, get involved. Get into an experiment or two. Feel how messy it is to unlearn supremacy and repurpose your life for liberation. Critique as a participant who is shaping the work. Be willing to do whatever task is required of you, whether whatever you are capable of. Feed people, spread the word, write pieces, make art, listen, take action, etc. Be able to say, I invest my energy in what I want to grow, to see grow. I belong to efforts I deeply believe in and help shape those. If no, divest your energy and attention. Pointing out the flaws of something still requires pointing at it, drawing attention to it, and ultimately growing it. Over the years, I have found that when a group isn't serving the people, it doesn't actually last that long, and it rarely needs a big takedown. Things just sunset, disappear, fade away, absorb into formations that are more effective. If it helps you feel better, look in the mirror and declare, there are so many formations I am not a part of. My non-participation is all I need to say. When I do offer a critique, it is from a space of relationship, partnership, and advancing a solution. And finally, if you don't want to invest growth energy in anything, just be quiet. If you are not going to help birth or raise a child, then you aren't required to have or even work toward the solution. But if you know a change is needed and your first instinct when you see people trying to figure out how to change and transform is to poop on them, perhaps it is time you just hush your mouth. As Detroit movement ancestor Jimmy Boggs taught, it is only in relation to others' bodies that many somebodies and many somebodies that anybody is somebody. Don't get in get into your cotton picking mind that you are somebody in yourself. Footnote six, Grace Lee Boggs Living for Change in Autobiography. We are all learning what it means to be somebody to shape the future, to operate at the scale of transformation. Okay, we're about halfway through this book already. Next section will be on resilience. And yeah, I think that's a good place to stop for now.
I hope you have a good day and stay cool or stay warm wherever you are. Um, and we will keep reading next time. Talk to you later.